context lecture for The Great Gatsby. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the social, historical, and personal context for F. Scott Fitzgerald's great novel. This is the original cover of The Great Gatsby when it was published in 1926. And as you can see, we learn a lot about the book just from looking at the cover. We see a disembodied uh, woman's face in the night sky. Uh, we see what looks like a tear, but actually is kind of a green light shining on what looks like water underneath the eye. And if you look closely, you'll see um, two golden uh, nude female figures in the eyes. Um, and that foreshadows, well, that doesn't foreshadow much, but clearly we, we have some kind of image of a, of a ghostly woman and her, and her piercing eyes at the background of this, uh, this love story. The cityscape that is underneath this face is also important to the novel because this is a very urban novel, as I'll explain. And the city of Manhattan is almost like a major character in the book. So in this lecture, we'll, we'll get into many of those aspects and some of the, some of the background to them. So I'd like to begin with an exploration of the person who sat down to write this book um, almost 100 years ago. His name was F. Scott Fitzgerald, and uh, as you can see from his relatively short life, um, that he, he burned hot and burned early, and then burned out early as well. Um, he ex experienced quite a bit in those 44 years, and uh, because of, of a, an unfortunate drinking habit, ended up dying uh, penniless, or virtually penniless, and alone in a Los Angeles uh, apartment. Um, he was trying to jumpstart his career um, by making it in Hollywood. He was um, working on his last novel called The Last Tycoon at the time he died, and um, his death alone sort of is the result of a lot of things that happened to him, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, in terms of his background, F. Scott Fitzgerald was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, to a family that was uh, not rich financially, but was rich in name, which is kind of a strange concept to Americans, but there was a time uh, when families who could trace their origins back to the earliest times of our country um, and experienced early prosperity, were able to claim a certain amount of authority and, and prestige in this country, kind of like um, nobility in Europe uh, and in England or in Great Britain, uh, where if you belong to an old house, no matter what your financial situation was, um, you could still claim a certain amount of, of, of superiority and status in society. Um, I always tell the story of my uncle, my great uncle, Uncle Klaus von Trotta, who was a baron from Prussia, from a very old, famous military family. Uh, he had a castle um, that he grew up in, actually. But uh, later in his life, during World War II, everything was lost, and uh, he ended up living in a very cramped apartment in Munich, Germany. Um, but still, despite the fact that he was very, very poor, um, living off of a very small military pension, he still uh, felt very superior to, uh, to everyone around him, even those who had uh, much more money than he did. So that's kind of how Escott Fitzgerald grew up. He was uh, not rich, but his extended family um, was able to finance quite an elite education for him, including a very fancy boarding school on the East Coast and eventually Princeton University. Um, he went to Princeton but failed out of it because he just honestly partied too much and uh, he started to have some success as a writer so he dropped out to pursue that career. Um, he ended up serving in World War I, which is important because many of the characters in the story also shared that experience and so he was able to bring a little bit of his, his military service um, and his knowledge of it into the writing of the book. All right, the Another important personal context is the marriage between F. Scott Fitzgerald and his uh, doomed wife, Zelda. And as you can see in this picture, they are kind of uh, a bit of a glamorous couple. We have a beautiful convertible car, 
I assume it belongs to 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 them. Um, we see uh, them both both dressed in the latest fashions of the 1920s. Their beautiful house on Long Island in the background, and this is the glamour image, glamorous image that that followed these two uh, in in their early marriage days in New York City. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, when he was um, preparing to ship off for war, was stationed in Alabama and was invited to a party for officers, uh, which he was. Um, and at that party, which was thrown by Zelda's family, he met Zelda. And that is exactly how Gatsby, it, Great Gatsby, in the story, meets the character of Daisy. As you'll see, um, she comes from an old, uh, well-off family, in, not in Alabama, but in Kentucky. And Gatsby uh, was also uh, a, a, an officer um, stationed there who met uh, Daisy at a party. Um, and like Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald at the time was was not a wealthy guy. He was he was virtually penniless, only having the the for clothing the uniform that he was wearing at the time. And um, and actually for many uh, many of the years of their early relationship, uh, Fitzgerald tried to. Uh, he asked Zelda to marry him, and she refused uh, because uh, he didn't have enough money to support her. And um, only when he published his first novel, *The Side of Paradise*, was she uh, willing to uh, to marry him and 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 spend her life with him. And so, I, I'm not sure how much of a judgment that is against her, but that certainly uh, makes its way into the book where. Um, but I don't want to give away too much. Uh, but money is it plays a role. Money and status plays a role. Play both play a role in Gatsby's relationship with Daisy. Um, so these two in New York uh, cut f quite the figure in society circles. They were at all the all the right parties. They they knew all the right people in the literary scene, and um, things were going very well. But uh, both of them had issues for sure. Uh, Zelda especially struggled with some mental health issues, and when they were living in France, uh, and F. Scott Fitzgerald was. Um, putting the pieces together for his latest novel, which would, appear, which would eventually become The Great Gatsby, they had some trouble in their marriage. Um, Zelda had an affair with a French airplane pilot who um, was in their, in their region in the south of France, and, and she even asked him for a divorce, which he refused. And so we see signs of friction in the, no in the novel itself, too, because a lot of the relationships, uh, the, especially the marriages between Daisy and Tom, also have some difficulties very similar uh, to the ones that F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda were going through at the time. And uh, it is also interesting that some of the lines that Daisy Buchanan utters in the story um, are actually things that Zelda herself said. When Zelda gave birth to her daughter, Franny, in, uh, and I forget the year, but um, when she when she found out that she was a girl, she um, exclaimed, "I hope she's a beautiful little fool because that's the only way to be a woman in this world." Uh, meaning that you know, I hope she's beautiful because that's the only thing that's going to give her value. And the fool part is very interesting too because um, I think she's saying that it you have to be um, you can't be too intelligent uh, as a woman in the world because maybe you're a threat to, uh, to the men around you uh, if you're too smart. And so it's a sad statement of what sorts of issues um, these um, uh, women in the 1920s, just a few years after getting the right to vote, were experiencing. Also important to this novel are the, is the context of New York City. Um, so we always want to ask ourselves what forces shape the writing of the novel. And we see in uh, the early part of the 20th century, late part of the 19th century, a real rise in um, the prominence of American cities, where cities like Manhattan and uh, Chicago and Detroit and New York, uh, I think I already mentioned, were growing in leaps and bounds. And so we see people flocking to the cities um, and experiencing things that they hadn't experienced before in the countryside. And we see also this real sense of, of uh, cultures mingling in cities like New York and especially neighborhoods like Harlem. People live together and work together and rub shoulders in ways that were not necessarily the case uh, decades before in, in more rural places. 
And so cities became not only places of, of opportunity financially, but they became places where people could go and become new people, uh, become different and be exposed to new things. And uh, one famous line in the book is uh, by Gatsby, uh, Nick uh, Carraway, the narrator, who says as they drive over the, uh, the Queensboro Bridge into, um, into up the Upper East Side of Manhattan, he says as he drove over the, the, the bridge that anything can happen, anything at all in the city. And as you look at these images here of people coming to, the, to Manhattan uh, on the ferry by, by, by the boat full, <laughs> You get a sense of just the the, the sheer number of people who, who found their lives um, together in this in this urban environment. So I'll just let this play for a few moments, so you can get a sense of the kind of world in which this book takes place. Okay, so other historical contexts, uh, there are other forces that shape the writing of the novel. When F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote this book, uh, he wrote it during the time of Prohibition, which was uh, when the U.S. government um, passed an amendment banning the sale and consumption of alcohol. And um, obviously the sale of alcohol did not stop, <laughs> the consumption of alcohol did not stop. There were always ways for people to pursue vices, I suppose. and so. One of the things that we saw arise was uh, organized crime, uh, the mafia, and uh, it, it is one name for it. And we see uh, people like Al Capone uh, and others uh, amassing massive amounts of money through the illegal sale of what they call bootleg uh, liquor, bootleg alcohol, which they somehow found found a way to make and found a way to sell. And um, we see that world very much part of this novel. Uh, also important historically is the what we call a de facto class system. De facto means it just sort of happens uh, naturally. Um, it's not official, but it happens. And there's a class system in which we have a conflict between people who have old money versus people with new money. F. Scott Fitzgerald came from an old family with prestige because they'd been around for a while and they'd had some success at, at various points in, in their history in this country. Um, I'm thinking of uh, families like the Bush family, where two, you know, the Bush Bush Senior uh, and then Bush Junior were both presidents of the United States. Um, you don't get that way without a certain amount of social power. Um, we uh, see that kind of old money coming into conflict with so-called new money, people who are making a lot of money on the stock market, for example, or making money in organized crime, who are able to buy their way into places where rich people live, buying giant mansions, but because they weren't from that old money world, they didn't have the right name and the right connections, they were still considered as outsiders. And uh, we will see that Gatsby himself comes from the new money world, whereas the Buchanans, Tom and Daisy, are very much old money. Their, gen their family has been rich for generations. And for that reason, Gatsby finds it hard to find acceptance. Also important in the writing of this book is the backdrop of World War I. Gatsby fought in that war. Nick Carraway, the narrator, fought in that war. Tom Buchanan did not uh, because he was able to get out of, uh, being <laughs> out of serving um, because of his wealth and influence. Um, we also see in the background the revolution in Russia in 1917 where the Tsarist regime was overthrown by the Bolsheviks, um, an example of a world increasingly thrown into chaos. Um, we also see the rise of fascism in Spain with uh, Franco, the, the rise of Mussolini in um, Italy, and also the rise of Hitler later on in Germany. Uh, we see 
a response to an, a very complex world being um, the kind of simple answers found in fascism. Uh, and that is a little bit in the backdrop of this book as well. Other social contexts, including artistic and literary context, also uh, shaped the, uh, the writing of this novel. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote a short story that he called The Jazz Age, and that, that term kind of stuck. And uh, what he meant by that was, was complicated, actually, because obviously we hear jazz music, like the music you hear in the background here, uh, which was sort of a soundtrack to the 1920s. It was uh, the, the popular music of his time, but it was also kind of like the hip-hop of its day in that it was music made by African Americans initially, and then, uh, some, and then it reached a much wider audience later on. And there were complicated racial dynamics to that rise of, um, of jazz music because, obviously, we, as we see in this picture, um, we see white musicians playing in places called the Cotton Club in, in Manhattan. And the Cotton Club um, featured African-American performers as well as white performers, but it was actually uh, a place that did not officially admit African-Americans into it. And so we see uh, white white uh, musicians and white patrons uh, appropriating some of the, the sounds and, and attitudes of jazz music, but also reinforcing some of the racial, um, racial injustices that, that existed elsewhere in the country. Um, there's a lot of mention of jazz music in this book. Gatsby's Party in Chapter 3 uh, features music that, uh, that would have been played in the Cotton Club, played by guys that look like this. Um, jazz music has a lot of interesting connotations. For example, the, the word jazz is actually a euphemism for sex and uh, kind of makes reference to its roots in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, where it was music that uh, arose from a lot of different musical influences, mostly African, um, but also was music that was played in houses of prostitution, uh, in waiting rooms for, for the patrons, um, for entertainment and also for, uh, well, to, it was a noise to cover uh, other noises that might have existed there, if you know what I'm saying. All right, we're going to move on. Um, also important uh, in the background of this was the, the rise of the so-called flappers. And in 1920, um, we see women uh, with the 19th Amendment gaining the right to vote. Uh, and alongside that, that newfound power in society, we see women beginning to flex their muscles socially and start to, to push uh, back against some of the boundaries that were imposed upon them in earlier generations. We see much more uh, liberal attitudes towards dress. You can see by the, the, the shortness of these uh, skirts that those old stuffy dresses of the 19th century have given way to, uh, to much looser, more revealing clothing. Um, and we also see women you know, dancing uh, freely um, and not so much worried about uh, appearing, uh, appearing proper all the time. Um, and then we also have um, the haircuts getting a little shorter, a little bit more androgynous. Uh, women are, are exploring um, sexual identity in, in ways that they might not have before. Okay, next uh, social and artistic context is modernism. Now this book is regarded as a modernist work and hopefully it will become clear why by the time we get to the end of the book. Um, the modernist era it's hard to define, but roughly speaking, it, it sort of started in the, the 19th century and ran up until the mid 20th centuries when we got into postmodernism and, and, uh, and so on. But we're going to talk about modernism as an artistic and, and philosophical and social movement. Um, modernism as a, as a way of thinking boils down to something called subjectivity. Uh, in, the, in the modernist era, subjectivity reigned supreme. And what that meant was that if you were an artist creating work that was helping you make sense of the world, your particular take and your point of view on society was determined by your point of view alone. Um, and I'll explore that idea a little bit more later in other slides. But some of the highlights of modernist art included experimentation with form. We saw people making all kinds of crazy looking art that, um, that attempted to explore the artist's uh, unique points of view and their unique, unique tastes, uh, takes on what reality was. And as a result, we also see kind of the breaking up of narrative form. Uh, stories in the modernist era don't happen in straight lines. They don't follow that uh, necessarily that plot uh, graph that we, that we have studied 
Um, stories are a little bit more experimental. Things uh, don't have neat endings like uh, Shakespeare's stories. Uh, there are a lot more unanswered questions and things that are vague and unclear in uh, modernist novels, uh, mostly because modernists, uh, modernist artists and thinkers were very skeptical of the whole idea that there was anything uh, such as truth in this world, or at least anything such as one truth. Everything had at least four or five different ways that they could be true, and um, there was no one shared story that we had in our world. Everybody had their own truth. This is really evident in the work of Picasso. Uh, this is his famous Guernica painting, painted after the bombing of the town of Guernica in Spain by uh, combined uh, German forces and Franco's forces. Um, and as you can see in this painting, we see uh, a version of reality, the reality of that bombing, which doesn't look like photographic reality. Uh, this, for example, uh, image of a, a mother lamenting her, her dead child after the bombing um, is not realistic, quote unquote, in the sense that it doesn't look like a, a, a human being that we would recognize. But um, Picasso is bending the rules of what looks real and emphasizing just the emotion, the, the, the pure um, anger and sorrow that we see in this woman upon the, the, the death of her child during this bombing. And so Picasso, like many modernist artists, is playing with form and willing to break away from, from traditional ways of representing reality in an attempt to represent what his subjective version of the truth might have been. Uh, we see uh, this throughout this painting, dismembered body parts, broken swords, heads coming from nowhere <laughs> in particular. These, these images are, are not real or don't seem real, but they are real in, in terms of what they make us feel. And that was one of the points of modernist work, to, to, to focus on um, experimenting with form to um, try to recreate uh, a reality which, which was unique uh, to the artist. So, again, the assumptions of modernism include this idea that there is no common narrative. And what I mean by that is, in previous uh, generations, in, especially in Western society, the church um, and institutions that connected to it were um, largely uh, uh, the source of, of truth and explanation. When things happened, it was that often they were, they were explained in religious terms. Um, and with the rise of humanism and the Enlightenment, we see the decrease of the influence of the church and the increase in a focus on rational thought and on individuals' ability to make sense of the world. Um, writers like Descartes and Rousseau uh, emphasize these ideas throughout the Enlightenment. Um, the result of that, it's complicated, but the result of that is that increasingly we have very, uh, very little in the modernist world that we can rely on for truth. There are, um, if there are a million people uh, in, in a city, there are a million different versions of what is real and what is true in the modernist way of looking. Um, and th the modernist belief is that an individual's truth is the only one that he or she could really be certain of. Uh, everything else in the world is considered relative or, or illusory um, or um, something we can't really trust. And so this feeling of um, anxiety is a big part of modernist literature and art uh, because if we don't know what the answer is, we get anxious. And that's, that's modern life according to, uh, to, that, to those artists. And one other thing that, that uh, arose in the modern era was the rise of psychology. Um, philosophers like Sigmund Freud um, had this whole idea of the subconscious. And the idea behind Sigmund Freud's work was that there are aspects of our own thoughts and minds and souls that, that even we are unaware of um, and can only be revealed through dreams or through psychoanalysis. Um, and the Freudian in psychology even though a lot of it is, in my opinion, a little wacky, um, really gave rise to this idea that, that people um, are essentially unknowable. That even if we, if we think we know somebody, and even if people think they know themselves, uh, things can happen to release thoughts and feelings and actions that, that are very unpredictable. And so um, human beings and human, human behavior, if, you, if you're a Freudian, 
are very much um, the product of forces that we really don't understand. So if you can never really know yourself or ever know the people around you, imagine how that increases the sense of, of, uh, of anxiety and, um, and subjectivity. So uh, more on art. Uh, with that whole idea, we can see artists kind of playing once again with, with this idea that your point of view is subjective. So this is the, the great um, artist Modigliani, uh, an Italian French um, uh, portrait artist mostly, and this is a photograph of him, handsome fella. But on the right hand side, this is a painting of himself that he did, a self a self portrait, and obviously he has no eyeballs uh, or at least no pupils. He's uh, his head is much too big for his body, but we can see that his point of view of himself is exaggerated and very subjective. And so this would be considered, in his view, a very real portrait of himself, whereas this photograph is merely a photograph that has no real truth to it. It's just an image. This, because it's uh, full of his subjective thoughts, is uh, realer than anything else. Uh, we see this again in the work of Monet. Uh, this is a photograph of British Parliament where um, King James was when they tried to blow him up in 1604. And this is the famous bell tower with the bell Big Ben inside it uh, in London. And this is Monet's version of that same place. And as you can see, this is very different from Monet's version. And one thing that you notice is just uh, the use of color and texture and what Monet was really trying to do was to paint subjectively his version of what was true of British Parliament on the Thames River in London. And he was also trying to paint time. You can see there's a lot of movement in the, in the, um, in the paint and we almost see the, the sun going down and the water moving because of how he paints it. And his goal, I think, was to, was to paint something that felt real to him. Uh, and, and um, much realer than this because this, this represented how he saw it at the time he was painting it. Um, so, some common themes in modernist work, uh, isolation, anxiety, uncertainty, uh, violence in society as well, uh, irony and absurdity. If, if, nothing, if there is no common story and, and if we can't believe in any one thing, then of course life is absurd and ridiculous and doesn't make any sense. So we see a lot of that in, in literature of the time. There is always a tension between the, the self versus society. If your truth is the only one that matters, that often puts you into conflict with, with the rest of, of society. We see a lot of that in modernist books and painting. There is a real tension between chaos versus order because uh, if you believe that everybody's truth is, is the same and every, everything is subjective, then that leads to a real sense of, of chaos, um, uh, as you can imagine. And um, we see uh, some of these themes in this wonderful but dark painting by Edward Hopper called Nighthawks at the Diner. We see this urban landscape and late at night, these figures are, are, are there very much isolated from each other and you can kind of sense the, the coldness and the, the isolation and anxiety caused by modern life in a big city like this. This is an excerpt from a T.S. Eliot poem called The Hollow Men and uh, this is another cheerful one. Uh, I'll just read it a little bit. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind and dry grass, or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom remember us, if at all, not as lost violent souls, but only as the hollow men the stuffed men. Well, <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think it takes much to to kind of get you to feel how how uh, sad and and uh, pessimistic this this poem is about human life. Um, these men are hollow men. This woman is a hollow woman. They have no um, they have nothing they can count on or rely on. They have no relationships with each other, and so they are like. Um, referring back to Shakespeare's uh, Macbeth in his Tomorrow and Tomorrow, Tomorrow soliloquy, soliloquy uh, poor players who strut and fret their hour upon the stage, uh, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. 
and uh, that's kind of the message of the hollow men as well. Um, we're going to see this later in the Great Gatsby in chapter 3, where in the, the so-called Valley of Ashes, uh, Nick Carraway describes this scene. He says, About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a Valley of Ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke, and finally, with a transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak, and comes to rest, and immediately the ash-gray men swarm up with leaden spades and stir up an impenetrable cloud, which screens their obscure operations from your sight." The melancholy nature of this and also the way in which these, these workers in this kind of garbage dump full of ash, um, which is the, the byproduct of, of all the, the coal burned at factories used to, to fuel the building of cities and the, the rise of industrialization in this country, is, uh, is pretty telling and reminds me a lot of the T.S. Eliot poem because these are human beings who have been sort of reduced to, uh, to shells. They are hollow men. They are gray. And uh, that's kind of the dark side of society that we see in The Great Gatsby. So um, that is my last slide. And I hope you enjoy this, this book that takes place in New York of the 1920s. Um, please remember some of these modernist themes and ideas and also some of the personal context and historical context because they really help us to understand the development of the characters and also some of the core ideas that we see uh, throughout the book. Thanks very much.